Uh, well, I think we should start because uh, otherwise it's going to be too late. Uh, welcome uh, again to this second day of the Pacific Soil Partnership meeting, this fifth meeting of the Regional Partnership for the Pacific. Um, today, normally we should, um, as per the agenda, we should uh, talk and present about the GSP pillars, updates and way forward. So the main activities implemented over the five GSP pillars of actions and uh, um, some other topics like the collaboration with the Coronavia Joint Work on Agriculture and an update on the status of the World Soil Resource Report 2025. Uh, still, as you may recall from yesterday, um, we didn't have time to let all country representatives to present. So we, I would like to invite those country representatives who didn't uh, got the chance to present yesterday to present today at the beginning of the meeting, and then we can proceed with the agenda. Uh, therefore, I would like to invite uh, the focal points who will present to um, uh, squeeze their presentation in five minutes if possible, uh, so we can um, have all the items of the agenda covered without um, having too much delay. Um, as yesterday we finished, we conclude the meeting with the updates from New Zealand. I think we should start from Niue, and I think the representative from Niue is here, Mr. Poyo Kesene. Yes, I can see you. So uh, thanks for your participation, Mr. Kesene, and I will give you the floor. Yeah, thank you, Filippo. If you can, uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, greetings from, from Niue. Um, if you can share the screen uh, for my presentation, please, uh, Filippo, and uh, hopefully. Sure. I'll Just a second. Let me let me open it. Yeah, you are. Let me know when you want me to change the slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Filippo. And also, I'd just like to apologize for um, taking us back. Um, I noted there was a very busy agenda yesterday, but I was um, able to squeeze in our, our, our brief presentation for today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm uh, Poi Okiseni. I'm the current director for the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. I'm not yet, um, I'm, I'm, I haven't met uh, most of you, but I have met some. Uh, and also just like to acknowledge uh, Filippo for giving me the opportunity uh, to be able to do our presentation uh, for today. And uh, if we can proceed, thanks. So straight on to the presentation in terms of relation to pillar one and also uh, the activities that are also uh, implemented uh, at the national level and also to promote sustainable soil management uh, practices. So. Uh, we have the one department of agriculture, forestry, and also fisheries uh, that um, it's also under the Ministry of Natural Resources. So some activities at the national level that uh, we have been uh, doing leading up uh, uh, to this year, very much around uh, promoting mulching and also composting in our farms and also working closely with uh, the New Island Organic Farmers Association, uh, which is the Neofa uh, main body. It was also uh, NGO body, but, but it's also uh, housed within our premises uh, and also just to promote organic farming principles at the national level. So a lot of the activities are very much uh, in line with the national strategic plan of government uh, and also uh, we have the ag sector plan that is also expired uh, that takes into account uh, soils and also uh, organic farming principles uh, to be able to uh, be promoted at the national level. I know that also, uh, I'd also just like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Siwa has also done some work for us over the years, uh, once with uh, SPC uh, and also doing uh, some work for New England. So we, under the um, Neof umbrella, we are promoting organic certification process with uh, New Zealand Bio, uh, but uh, we are still under suspension uh, uh, over the last two years, as we all know, uh, with uh, COVID, uh, the auditors were unable to be able to come here and also to do the auditing process. 
uh, but our, our focus is very much on vanilla production uh, and also uh, fruit trees uh, at this point in time as import uh, substitution as well. Um, and uh, we have also promoted sustainable land management practices under a couple of uh, UNDP uh, funded uh, projects uh, and also promoting agroforestry, uh, including uh, Mukuna legume uh, cover crop uh, with, with uh, previous um, uh, projects. Uh, move on, please. Yes, so under pillar two and also some of the activities um, um, uh, in terms of raising awareness and also communications and uh, also um, in, in terms of policy documents uh, and also education. So we have in, in, in previous years, um, uh, I think it was only in 2017, we, we launched our new um, uh, source resource manual and also just like to acknowledge FAO and also Lancare New Zealand for and also Jeff. Uh, funding. We're also able to fund, uh, this is the first uh, reference uh, soil manual for, for Niue and also previous um, findings uh, through Landcare uh, New Zealand uh, and also previous uh, scientists who, who did all the, uh, the survey work leading up to uh, started all the way back in the 60s, 60s 70s and, uh, and was uh, was the first manual to be able to be produced for, for Niue. And also Niue only consists of the one island, so it's, it's much more uh, easier uh, rather than having, uh, as, as I have noted, in the, in the Pacific, there are, um, uh, uh, with, uh, with other Pacific island countries, very much scattered uh, around um, in the ocean, but we only have the one island, so that, that makes it easier uh, for us as well to carry out all this work. So um, after, when the soil manuals, manual was launched, uh, there was a need also to, we, we noted that the manual was a bit too scientific for, for the growers and the farmers. So we also uh, decided to do the fertility of new soils in relation to crop growth document, uh, still through FAO and Jeff and also with land care in New Zealand. And this is uh, a very much watered down uh, document uh, to be able to, uh, for the growers and also uh, for students as well. So the source of new uh, manual for the Department of Education as well. It's very much uh, a document uh, to guide some of the students in line uh, with the, the main um, source manual uh, for new way. Thanks. If you can move on, please, uh, Filippo. So yes, some, uh, again, we, we have been using uh, our World Food Day, National Agriculture Soil Day activities also to promote um, our World Soil Day uh, and also soils. Uh, we have the, the, re the recent uh, Nimetaro Day, uh, which we, uh, was the first one this year. And the, the, these are some of the avenues that we have used to promote uh, some of the um, soils work as well. So working closely with Niofa, like uh, I alluded to, and also with the New Growers um, Association. We also have a fortnightly radio, uh, radio agricultural awareness program along with our Facebook page uh, with the Department of Agriculture, uh, Forestry and Fisheries. So these are some of the um, avenues that we have been using to, uh, for raising awareness uh, with regards to soils uh, matters in New England. Thanks. So yes, and under the pillar four, uh, we also, in terms of uh, soil data, and uh, we, uh, we we have the soil map, like I mentioned before, we, we only have the one consist of the one island, and it's also, uh, it's only a very small island, uh, it's only 1,700 people we signed here. So with COVID, we have five cases in the isolation uh, so far, and uh, no cases in, in the community, but also we, we have these um, uh, uh, tools in place, uh, such as the soil map that was developed way back uh, in 1965 when the, those scientists that I've alluded to did some work for, for New England and did all the surveys uh, and was only in uh, 2007 that we, we were able to develop the first 
uh, soil map for, for New Ireland and uh, yeah, acknowledging also the support uh, and the funding towards this in line also with the reference manual for, for New England. Moving on. So yes, in uh, pillar three and also pillar five, uh, this, is the, this is the last slide uh, for my presentation this morning. So in terms of, in relation to research and development, uh, there's very little uh, or to no research at this point in time. So yeah, we need uh, to, to, to do more research. I mean, we have had the soils manual and uh, we, we, we have much impact on, on, on all those information and those tools, uh, but uh, it's also an opportunity for students as well uh, to be able to, to take up the, the career path. We also work with schools. Uh, we only have the two schools that uh, we have a career path uh, every uh, two weeks uh, in working with the schools and trying to promote agriculture uh, and, and also leading students to, towards uh, career path. Other than that, we, we work with uh, one private sector uh, in, in biochar development. Uh, um, and also it's, it's quite a new um, phenomenon for, for us, but it, it's not new in a sense. Our, our ancestors have been using charcoal and, and I can recall in our DSEP and uh, CEO over the years with SBC, we have done trials and also using charcoals and uh, uh, in that sense. But we also did some proposal for further funding, uh, which didn't uh, eventuate it uh, in the end. So in relation to pillar five, uh, in terms of harmonization of methods and uh, indicators in relation to soils uh, and, and also soil laboratories, we don't have a soil laboratory as such. Uh, all the soil samples uh, in the past, we have been able to send to New Zealand, uh, to Hills Laboratory, and uh, I think it's in uh, Hamilton, uh, New Zealand. And, and mainly uh, there's the need, and also the samples are very minimal, uh, but, but at this point in time, it, it's also a very costly exercise. So if we are, uh, the transportation means in, into the log logistical, means in trying to send them overseas, it's quite hard, even if we had to send to other Pacific County countries or Fiji or I know Alafua have got their uh, laboratory as well. But it's also a costly exercise at this point in time. We only still direct to New Zealand. We only have the one flight um, to New Zealand and the boat uh, vessel comes into New Air uh, once every three weeks. So those are some of the challenges that we face. And uh, I'd just like to, that's the end of my presentation this morning. And uh, thank you for the opportunity and also just like to acknowledge FAO and, uh, and also all the key stakeholders. Thank you, Filippo, for giving us an opportunity to be able to uh, do our brief presentation. I think soils play a vital role in the Pacific and in line with climate change nowadays. Uh, yes, and uh, it, it is a reality that we need to look after our soils uh, in line with also the FAO's uh, strategic plan for a better environment and better life uh, for us. And uh, thank you, Filippo. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mr. Kesene. It was very interesting to hear from, uh, from you, from the situation in the islands and, if, and the challenges that you're facing there regarding soil management um, and all the related aspects. Uh, so thank you again for your participation, for sharing uh, the updates on your country. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, colleagues from Palau are, are present here. I don't see Mr. Telay um, in the list of participants. Just I want to double check if there is uh, anyone from um, Palau. Otherwise, I will move fo uh, forward to the next country, that is Papua New Guinea. Mm, just want to check if uh, Mr. Francis Dank is with us. I'm not sure about that. In the meantime, maybe we can move to Samoa. And I would invite, I saw the clicks from Samoa before. Yes. Good morning from Samoa. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you want uh, us to start? Yes, please. If you could uh, present your um, the updates on soils for your country. Thanks. Right. Have you seen our screen? Uh, yes, it's loading. Yeah, we can see it. Can you put in presentation mode, please? 
Yes. Thanks. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Yep. Uh, so apology from uh, Mr. David Hunter and uh, Dr. Sim Seo, who uh, is not available at a, at a time. But uh, my name is uh, Aleni Welese. I'm working in SROS. <clears throat> we used to work uh, at the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, but now we moved to SROS. Now uh, we are here in SROS, so happy to uh, present uh, some of the, the findings that uh, uh, Dr. David Hunter and Sam Seu prepared a presentation for us this morning. <clears throat> Our main activities implemented under Pillar 1, as uh, in the presentation, it's ongoing promotion of magic beans, as uh, some of the colleagues, they presented the Mokuna princess as one of the cover crop during shorter fallow periods. This is due to lack of unavailable uh, available land. Ongoing promotion of uh, uh, nitrogen fixing trees in roots and tree crops productions. It's about 300 acres of coastal land, four villages in uh, Upolu and two villages in Savai. Those are the islands, the big islands of Samoa. It's a problem with food and fruit trees using dynamic agroforestry. In technology with coconut as the focal tree crop. And this is funded by the World Bank uh, funded project. The use of locally available chicken manure as a fertilizer option to chemical NPK fertilizers in tunnel houses, vegetable productions. And uh, it's about 108.180 installed tunnel houses in both islands, Upolu and Savai. And this is funded by the Samoa China uh, Agricultural Project. Need to engage in the four 1,000 initiatives and recarbonization of global soils. And the question is how? And there's no sustainable soil management policies for Samoa yet. So we need assistance to develop one based on scientific evidence. Other implemented by the USP Samoa campus. And uh, I think uh, that is for pillar one. Main activities in uh, pillar two, there's very little investment in sustainable soil management, also in adequate coverage of soil science in the secondary and tertiary education institution, in their curricula or agriculture science subject in secondary school. This is also in soil science courses in the USP Samoa campus and also the National University of Samoa. And there is very little communication and awareness materials. Also very weak extension services in sustainable soil management for the farmers. And uh, I think that is for pillar two. Now we move up to pillar three. Main activities implemented. There is low priority on targeted soil research and development activities. And one of the projects uh, called the uh, Soil Management in Pacific Islands, investigating nutrients, cycling, and development of the soil portal uh, between MAF and SROS. And this is uh, funded by the ACR. And also byproducts from biogas digester uh, under the UNDP and uh, home biogas systems, trial as organic fertilizers for vegetable production, and the research is in progress. And also there's a weak research uh, trust and extension math linkage in sustainable soil management activities. MAF as a member of GRA on GHG emissions from agricultural activities, this is crop and livestock productions and still exploring potential partnerships. And uh, not only that, the collaboration between MAF and MNRE on quantification of GHG emissions from agricultural activities on land uses, et cetera, et cetera. This is a monitoring of soil environment contamination levels from herbicide use on commercial taro farms. And uh, that study is uh, uh, funded by SROS. USP Samoa campus soil research tailored to undergraduate and postgraduate soil research topics. 
And also is lack of formally trained local soil scientists in the Pacific, especially Samoa, support from expatriate soil scientists at the USP campus, but collaboration is very weak. And that is under pillar two. Now to mill up to pillar four. Main activities, large quantity of soil chemical, physical and biological data by USP Samoa campus, math, MNRE and source. And we need to access quality, applicability for sustainable soil management. And also we need training on how to use the Pacific Soil Portal, need assistance to re-engage in GLOSIS, MNRE holds a digital land and soil maps for Samoa government. In pillar five, main activities, laboratories with soil analysis capabilities and the SROS and the USP Samoa campus. Soil analysis limited to soil fertility evaluations and we need to strengthen collaboration between MAF, SROS and the USP Samoa campus on fertilizer recommendations based on soil testing. Soil SROS laboratory and INNZ accredited, accredited for food analysis only. SROS involved in GLO as ALN and uh, ASPAC Interlaboratory Proficiency Program. And we need support with this. Training needs for MEF extension officers on basic soil science to effectively disseminate fertilizer recommendations and other sustainable soil management practice to farmers based on soil analysis results. This is to explore a focus in formal training with USP Samoa campus for SROS research and math extension staff. And uh, that's all from us. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Have a good day. Thanks a lot, Mr. Vai, for the nice uh, the yeah. detailed presentation on Samoa. Um, yeah. I would like to um, uh, firstly move to the next country because time is against us. Uh, and I see Mr. Yeah. Jules yeah. Damutalau uh, should be with us. Therefore, I will invite representatives from uh, Solomon Islands to, um, to present the, the updates on soils. Yes, Jules, can you unmute, please? Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning to you. Time, yeah, I think I've got my uh, slide with you, so. I'm expecting you to put it on for me. Yes, just a second. <clears throat> Here you are. Oh, sorry. Over to you, Jules. Yep. Uh, yes, greetings and good morning again from the Solomon Islands. Uh, uh, by way of introduction, I guess uh, most of the nature of soils in the Pacific is similar, we, as we've just heard from Samoa. Um, um, from my view, in, in terms of the Solomon Island soils, basically there, there are um, at least four main um, uh, uh, farming systems which really deals with soil. We have um, we have un undulated, rugged mountain terrains. So we have slopes. People are farming on the slopes. We also have farming system on the coastal, which have um, some impacts with the um, uh, increase in the climate impacts as that is sea level rise. Um, also at the coastal level, we also experience inundation of uh, uh, farm soils, farming soils, and also intrusion of um, um, uh, salt water, and that is sea. And then we also have atolls that is mainly probably more like new way, I guess, uh, more sandy soil, and their farming systems are also different, and they have also um, um, their own constraints with regards to soil management and support to support farming. 
and then we have uh, mostly plains, which the, I think the most of the good soils uh, have been taken away by commercial plantations. So people are, are left to farm the slopes, uh, coastal areas, I mean, um, that is for the main islands. So traditionally, uh, shifting cultivation was the main, uh, the main type of farming with regards to our small holder and uh, for small holder. Um, and soil infertility has been an ongoing problem, I guess, expressed by most of the farmers. And that's generally, I guess, a, a scope of uh, our farming systems around here in the Solomon Islands. Um, by, the, by the way, um, by way of introduction, my name is Jules Damutalau, and I am with the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock. Um, currently, I'm presenting as a volunteer, I guess. Uh, I am aware we, we still do have a national focal point for this um, um, program. Um, that is what we'll, we'll, we'll do after, I guess. And uh, I am with the farming system soils uh, section within the agriculture research. Yeah, so uh, yeah, here are some of the um, uh, activities, I guess, uh, that is performed in reference to the pillar one. Um, on farm demonstrations, we did the lead farmers. Uh, in the Solomons, we mostly we work with, uh, especially with, from the agriculture perspective, we deal with um, lead farmers, farmers who are uh, passionate and uh, are willing to to actually take on new technologies. So, so we we used to have them as demonstra demonstration farms, and mostly we, with regards to soil, we we also. Uh, we encourage, promote uh, composting, uh, cover cropping, and yeah, with mukuna, that is one of those um, uh, more most uh, encouraged uh, cover crop. Uh, green manuring, uh, vetiver grass. Uh, this is for the slope um, uh, farms where uh, people farm along the slopes. So we encourage vetiver grasses contour to minimize soil erosion. And um, heavy melting to farmers on the plain, uh, flat land or plains. So most of this uh, work uh, is mainly done from uh, the ministry point of view with research and our agriculture extension, extension officers. I would also want to highlight Custom Garden as one of the champions in, in promoting organic farming. Uh, one of those uh, uh, local NGOs who has worked uh, probably more than 20 years now in promoting um, uh, um, soil uh, with regards to organic farming. And um, we also, um, with, with uh, urban, um, uh, urban setting, we also promote, this is through extension and especially with the women's, women in agriculture, the soup soup garden, it's more like a backyard uh, sort of approach to supporting our people living within and um, around the uh, city. Agriculture extension services and sustainable farming. Uh, there is a project currently that is also uh, targeting this one. And I guess most of the sustainable uh, farming was targeted in, onto soil, how, how best to manage soil in fertility, uh, soil quality. Um, and as I think the next point is just, again, re-emphasizing KGA has been the champion of uh, organic farming. Uh, I think I referred to this one. Uh, I, currently, there's a project on the FAO, which, which really um, uh, came up with a lot of materials now. I have uh, I've seen that uh, materials for farmers, for extension officers, uh, and uh, also for uh, a curriculum for high, sc high school and the university. So it's a, a, a big undertaking and the FAO, which is um, spearheaded by Live and Learn. Um, 
um, forest um, resources management. They are promoting uh, agroforestry in terms of managing soil as well, and uh, carbon trading. This is from the perspective of the Ministry of Forestry. And there's another NGO that is taking on this challenge in terms of supporting youth with regards to um, farming. And it is very, very, um, I would say, they, they, they've seen um, value chain and market as a push to, to encourage people going into um, good uh, farming practices or agricultural practices, which is uh, a, a good way forward for especially our young people here in the Solomon Islands. Next slide, please. Yes, and um, with regards to uh, activities implemented in reference to Pillar 2, uh, I think one of the uh, major activities with regards to agriculture is the World Food Day that is celebrated every year. And uh, uh, this will be like an agriculture show for at least a week, um, which uh, and invited all stakeholders uh, in the arena of um, agriculture and food. And uh, this is a very, um, what would I say, a, a very um, uh, powerful way of uh, disseminating information. And, and, uh, and uh, I've, I've observed that to be a very um, uh, good event, which messages are passed on to farmers and the public at large. Um, Development of agriculture extension materials and publications, I guess, would be one. And I've mentioned a FAO project that is, has already completed that one. Uh, lead farm and farm demonstrations. These are uh, uh, approaches where, where we disseminate information to our farmers um, uh, for that matter. Um, agriculture research on farm trials, on station trials, are also uh, uh, with, with, with also extension allows people to come and um, um, get a uh, first hand um, to see what actually is happening and uh, get first hand information. Uh, these are some activities under the ministry. Uh, we've also have a committee that has been set up. It's a national committee that over, oversees uh, sustainable land management. Um, that's, uh, it's called the Integrated Land Management. It's a very uh, strong committee, uh, which encompasses um, also institutions of, of Solomon Islands, as well as the ministry in trying to, to support um, uh, sustainable land management um, activities and I guess under land management there is always soil. Uh, we have a policy that is in support of um, um, if the language inside would be always sustainability uh, and investment. So we have there is a strong and powerful message as well as a support to um, um, uh, our ongoing work with regards to soil and and land management, um, uh, sustainable land management for that matter. Uh, in the recent past, we have a project which also, um, uh, during the project, they, they develop a land use, a rural land use planning policy, and it's in place at the moment, and uh, that also have support uh, to the work of soils. And then the climate change in the, um, in the view of agriculture and food security. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, Dulce, I should uh, ask you to please uh, try to speed up and, and, and move towards the finalization of the presentation soon, please. Yes, thank you. I guess the last one will be very short and sharp. Uh, main activity implemented under pillar three, soil research on various soil amendments. The research promoting biodiversity and microorganisms. That is what the, our current soil uh, research program is. Okay. And also soil erosion and contour uh, farming. Uh, yes, next please. Yeah. 
Yes, I think uh, one of those uh, very useful uh, um, uh, tools and uh, with regards to soil uh, um, management is this uh, study that was done extensively around Solomon Islands on land resources. And uh, I think uh, another step forward on that one was the digitization of that, uh, which is uh, already available for people to use. Major challenges. Yeah. Uh, okay, next, please. On Pillar 5, your soil laboratory, I think we have an existing lab. It's a new lab uh, under the university, uh, which also, uh, uh, I guess, uh, supports our work uh, from my from my perspective. And um, so the skills were used during our projects, past project, right? I guess that's, um, yeah, I think that's all. Thank you, Felipe, and thank you for your um, bearing with me. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, for the presentation of your country. Uh, this was really highly appreciated, and also for the nice details that you that you share. Thanks a lot for them. Um, I will move now to what I think is the last country. Uh, let's see if I'm not wrong. Let's see. I think uh, there is no one from Tokelau, unfortunately, unless Mr. Fatia or someone else from the country from Tokelau is is with us. Otherwise, I would give the floor to the colleagues from Tonga. Uh, Mr. Minononeti should be with us. Or someone else from Tonga. I think I saw someone before. Is there anyone from Tonga? Or is there anyone from any other countries that uh, did not present yet? Okay, let's see, because I think I saw someone from Tonga before, maybe they have uh, connection issues, but um, maybe we can give the, the floor to them later on uh, if they connect again. Uh, in the meantime, I think we should move forward because uh, again, I'm very sorry, but the agenda is, is, is pretty packed. And as yesterday, we didn't, um, succeed in, in including all the country presentation because uh, because of the time. Um, I will now like to uh, move to the program of today and give the floor to my colleagues from the GSP Secretariat who will present you uh, and update you on the activities of the Global Soil Partnership over the five pillars of action. And let me remind you that as it was mentioned yesterday by, by the Secretary of the GSP, Mr. Ronald Vargas, uh, this is the last time we will present, we will organize this activity in pillars as we will move forward uh, towards a new framework uh, of action for the GSP. Um, now still, other pillar one, I will invite my colleague, Mrs. Uh, Carolina Cardoso-Lisboa um, to take the floor and she will present you a very important initiative of GSP that is called RecSoil. It's about the recarbonization of global agricultural soils. So Carolina, over to you. Thanks again for your participation. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, I will speak about the, on the pillar one activity uh, about the program on work soil. Uh, which is called Recarbonization of Global Soils. Uh, yes, my name is Carolina Cardoso, and uh, I'm also a member of the GSP uh, Secretary of the FAO. So uh, we are all aware of, uh, of climate change and uh, all the, the threats, the challenge it has brought to us uh, in our sectors uh, and also for the agricultural sector. And uh, yeah, and uh, despite of those challenges, uh, also uh, in the agricultural sector, the good news is that the latest uh, IPCC reports uh, have also uh, identified soils as a, uh, our ally to help us to address those challenges and overcome the issues related to climate change, and also to contribute to the sustainable development goals. And uh, we do that by um, implementing sustainable soil management in the agricultural sector. 
So in this scenario, what we came with this proposal of implementing the REC soil program, which is an initiative uh, with the aim to scale up the implementation of sustainable soil management practices. The, and those practices are many, uh, are uh, soil organic coverage centered, which means uh, it aims to, to, to preserve or increase soil carbon stocks. Uh, as the main goals of the GIS program is to avoid further loss of soil organic carbon, maintain or increase soil organic carbon stocks, boost soil health by doing that, improve a farmer's livelihood and recognize farm, farmers for their contributions to the better environment, enhance food security and also food nutritional value, and they also uh, which materially build up systems resilience uh, and adaptation while supporting the provision of ecosystem service. So the uh, REC soil program uh, framework uh, has basically um, two paths. One path we call soil health path uh, or green path, which is focused in the improvement of soil health. And another one, it's a longer path, um, and uh, it, it's a follow-up after the first path, which is called soil health. We call it a carbon market path, and this one, it's aimed on the quantification of the balance of carbon inputs and uh, outputs in the system. And uh, to implement the REC soil, we have uh, some steps to do that. Uh, it's a very comprehensive approach. We started with technical feasibility, and then uh, identify committed farmers, uh, establish the, the agreement with them to work with the REC soil program. And then we start with the capacity building program to, to provide and strength local technical and extension service uh, at, uh, to farmers. And then we move forward to the implementation of good practices, so-called sustainable soil management practices. And then after a period of implementation of four years, we do the first assessment, uh, uh, MARV assessment. Uh, for the Green Path, we follow the protocol for assessment of sustainable soil management. And uh, if we go for the carbon market path, we use the GSOC MRV protocol. Uh, here uh, to the side, you see uh, the REC soil toolkits as is a summary of it. Uh, as I said, to do the technical feasibility assessment, we uh, use the, the GSOC SEC uh, approach developed by GLOSIS, which I believe you are very familiar with, to identify the areas with the highest potential to sequester carbon in soil. Uh, for the capacity building program, we have a series of capacity building sections. Uh, being one of them, the Soil Doctors Program, which my colleague Silvia will give you more details after, uh, later on. And we also have uh, all the capacity building training there for the uh, MRV protocols, how to, to implement that in the field. And also for laboratory uh, capacities um, through the, the uh, Glossolam uh, training sections. Um, and they also promote a series of workshopping uh, to uh, support the uh, knowledge change between farms. And uh, the other set of tools is uh, in the MRV protocols. As I just said, we use two protocols, the protocol for assessment of sustainable soil management or the GSOC MRV protocol. And we count with the support of the Glossolan Laboratory Network to do to analyze the samples from the, uh, that we take in the field following one of those protocols. So, as a benefit for farmers uh, once they join the Work Soil Program, is the improvement of technical uh, knowledge on sustainable soil management and provision of technical support throughout the implementation of the Work Soil Program. Uh, and the, to help them to implement sustainable soil management and improve soil health, enhance yield productivity, and also enhance system uh, resilience. Uh, also, uh, the implementation of sustainable soil management will decrease the needs for external inputs, uh, such as mineral fertilizers, pesticides, and the use of machinery. 
uh, as a result, uh, obviously there will be a uh, attempt to decrease the overall cost of production. And the implementation of the REX soil programs is also you help the farmers to be acknowledged for their sustainable contribution to the environment by support the provision of existing service. The idea is that the end of the first uh, each cycle of the program, we can uh, issue a kind of certificate to farmers to to acknowledge they have uh, to verify verify they have implemented sustainable soil management therefore contributes to the ecosystem service. So the implementation of the REC soil program has three phases with a step-by-step -step approach. And the duration of uh, each phase varies according to the readiness level of each partner in the project. And the strategy, the strategy to adopt the uh, implementation of REC soil tools is decided between the partners uh, uh, working in this collaboration in the program. Uh, just as, as a final message, we had started now this year with a few pilot countries, being uh, one of them Mexico, Costa Rica, and uh, uh, Kenya. And uh, we are also discuss, discuss with uh, another uh, countries uh, to start the pilot in Iraq soil. And uh, these countries has been identified based on the GSOC SEC. Uh, where we identify the areas with the highest potential. And hopefully once we succeed, we can uh, scale up the implementation of REC soil. So I'm sorry for the short presentation, but uh, I'm happy you have here my mail and uh, I'm very happy to answer any further question. My, there is any doubt there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Filippo. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Carolina. And especially for squeezing your presentation in, uh, in such a short time. But I'm sure the, the message reach uh, the participants. And again, uh, if you please can write your email also in the chat. Uh, so in case of need, um, participants can, can reach you for further information on the Rexwell program. Um, in the meanwhile, we can move forward to the um, pillar two. Um, I should start, but I will, be, I, wish, I will first give the floor to my colleague, uh, Silvia Pioli. Uh, as it's already late here in Italy. So Silvia, over to, over to you. And again, uh, if after your presentation, you may leave your email address in the in the chat so participants can, can write you in case of interest or if uh, they would like to receive further information on your presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I would like to thank you, Filippo, for that. My name is Silvia Pioli and I'm within the, the Global Soil Partnership. My activities are mainly related to the implementation of the Global Soil Doctor Program, which is a farmer to farmer training initiative. But before going through the implementation examples, so let me briefly stress some key points of the program. As you can see from this diagram, different uh, actors are involved in the implementation of this program. Although maybe the most important one is uh, the promoter, which is uh, the institution that coordinates the implementation at the local level and that uh, in collaboration with the GSP ensures the scaling up of the program in, uh, in the country. Uh, the roadmap, it's also quite uh, straightforward, uh, as I mentioned. The first step is the identification of the suitable uh, promoter, which is trained by the GSP. Then the promoter identifies the potential uh, soil doctors among a group of, uh, uh, of farmers and train them using the educational material provided by the GSP. And last, uh, the certified soil uh, doctors will train the other farmers in their own uh, communities. The, the GSP will request the promoter to agree with a term of reference where all the roles, responsibilities and benefits for the promoters are listed. And ultimately, the promoter should sign in in our database through this online form. This registration is just a way to formalize the collaboration and our mutual commitment. Uh, the GSP provides the support, the educational material and the visibility to the promoter. And in turn, the promoter provides the technical and financial support for the sustainability of the program in the, in the long term. We expect the promoter to provide us with feedbacks and inputs to improve the program and adapt it to the local context. Like for example, the topic of the training, 
that can be targeted to local needs. So speaking about trainings, these trainings are structured into modules, which include both the theoretical and practical session. And each module includes a series of posters with related field exercises that target a specific soil um, topic. In this case, for example, what is soil is our first module and it addresses uh, the main uh, soil physical, biological and chemical properties. And at the end of the, each module, there will be the evaluation uh, table and the recommendation table for the best practices to improve uh, the desired um, soil, uh, uh, soil characteristics. But uh, let's move on to some example of the implementation. Unfortunately, we didn't implement a pilot in the Pacific region yet, but we got the first meeting with Mr. Sua and uh, we agreed on the way forward, which is to find the suitable promoter or promoters, which can came from the extension service of the government, but also from the private sector. And then we should find the proper location to implement the pilot, uh, also in harmonization with the existing projects. And after that, we can agree on the module and we can start already to translate some posters to the local language. And then the next step would be to agree on the budget, on the size of the implementation and uh, so on. But I really wanted to show you some successful example of this uh, sorry, doctor program. So I will uh, report the experience of these two uh, countries that are quite uh, far away from each other, but can stress some similarities and differences as well. In Mexico, we have an association of universities that are the promoter of uh, the program, while, for example, in Bangladesh, we have the Ministry of Agriculture, which is the main promoter. In um, Mexico, the GSP already trained uh, more than 30 trainers, uh, but the training of the soil doctor is uh, still ongoing. And in Bangladesh, uh, we uh, trained uh, 10 uh, trainers, and these trainers already selected the 15 soil doctors. So I just wanted to report uh, some key moments of this uh, training. And uh, here you can see there are uh, both the theoretical explanation of uh, the posters, but also the field activities. And it, in this case, uh, we also received some inputs from uh, the, the pilot because they explained us uh, how to evaluate the soil pH using uh, simple uh, red cabbage water, for example. And similarly for uh, Bangladesh, we have the classroom. We have also the implementation in the field with uh, some uh, practical exercises. And in this case, we also have uh, the certificate the distribution for the successful soil doctors. I included just a couple of video here, but I don't want to show them. Uh, I'm sure that Filippo will share the link of the presentation so you can play them. And here I just reported some uh, very, um, the, the next uh, implementation activities, the next pilots, that would be Bolivia, which already started. And the next one will be Kazakhstan that is going to start in a couple of uh, weeks uh, from now. So regarding the, the link, the, the impact of this program, we are developing a new, a brand new website where we want to show uh, through this map, all the promoters that are implementing the program in their own country. But we would like to consider this map and the whole site, the website, as a sharing platform where the promoters from uh, any countries can share their own experience and learn from the experience of uh, the other promoters. And yes, I will drop in the chat also the link to some uh, highlights that have been published related to the Soil Doctor program and uh, or more pictures that can be uh, found in this file repository. So I um, hope this, present, this very short presentation triggered your attention. We are really looking forward to collaborate together for the implementation of the program in the Pacific regions. If you have other information, if you need further information or if you want to join the program, you can contact me or my colleagues at these email addresses and I'm sharing these addresses in the chat right now. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Silvia, for uh, being in the given time. And I agree with you, I think the, the program has a, has a, has a big uh, potential, especially in this region. Um, so I will invite, uh, I would like to invite country representatives to follow up with you uh, to move towards the um, identification of potential promoters to implement the, the, the program in the, in the Pacific countries. Uh, 
Um, if there is any question for my colleagues, Silvia and Carolina, so regarding the third doctor programs and the Rexel program, you can raise your hand or you can write in the chat. Um, yeah, otherwise you can follow up by email with them. And thanks again, Silvia, and thanks also to Siwa because I know uh, you're um, liaising with him for the exploring potential uh, promoters indeed for the implementation of the program in the Pacific Islands. Um, okay, I don't see any questions coming in this regard. Uh, so thanks, thank you again. Um, and I will move forward towards the, um, a new, uh, my presentation that will be very brief uh, and will cover the topic of uh, the policy briefs. Um, this is a most basically a proposal that we would like to share with you uh, according uh, to what is uh, being done, um, what is currently being done in the other regions uh, regarding this, the, these policy briefs. Uh, first, what is a policy brief? Uh, under the framework of the pillar two of the GSP, um, a policy briefs uh, as be, can be produced uh, aiming to uh, raise the awareness on soils and to provide uh, and to highlight the multiple role of soils um, to the different to the wide range of stakeholders, to regulators and policymakers in a given country or region. These are some examples that uh, about policy briefs that have been developed in uh, in the Near East and North African region. So basically, they agree on the topic according to the main needs of the region. Uh, these have been produced and even translated in the in local languages, and many others are on their way under preparation. Because as you can see, there is a strong need for this document to indeed to raise the awareness on these topics and on the best practices to uh, manage uh, soils according to the main soil threats affecting the region. And this, this of course, this, the threats change region by region. So this is the, an example from the Near East and North African country, region. Uh, in Asia as well, um, country experts and focal points agree to work on, a, on, a, on the first policy brief for the region is about the multifaceted role of soil in Asia, uh, and the structure of this document is reported in the uh, left lower corner of the, of, the, of the slide. So just 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 to give you an overview on uh, on the on what that the regions are doing in this regard to raise the awareness on on soils and on the best practices to to manage the soils. Um, the question is if. Uh, countries in the Pacific. So, if you members of the Pacific Soil Partnership would be interested in uh, in work on on this kind of activity. So, basically, if you would like to produce a policy brief for the Pacific soils, um, if so, on the left I reported a kind of roadmap that can be considered. But uh, so we're talking about agree, of course, on the main topics to to be covered. Uh, then we can establish a working group, uh, grouping together people who are willing to, to work on this document uh, on, on, or on a series of documents, um, define the structure. Uh, then, of course, the text can be reviewed within the, within the region. Can, uh, photos can be collected to be included in the, in, the, in the document. And then this can be published. Now, very briefly, I would like to hear from you if or we can follow up by email um, about the possibility to develop this kind of, uh, of document, this kind of material uh, for the Pacific region. And as Lucrezia mentioned in the chat, the, these documents are very important also because um, are, can be considered as a preferential pathways uh, to, to, get, to get projects um, because policy briefs not only raise the awareness on, on soils or, and on the main soil threats of the region, uh, but thanks to this, they can uh, be the base uh, and it can offer an opportunity to develop projects and uh, and mobilize financial resources on for, for the region and for and to implement the um, the best practices that can be uh, highlighted in the in this document uh, so i would like to hear from you or you can write in the chat or i don't know if even uh, i don't know peter what you think as chair of, of the of this of the specific soil partnership, if you think it is worth it to work on this kind of document, so basically on the writing, on the policy briefs, if any of you have already experience, if any of you already work on the, of, for instance, national policy briefs, 
uh, we would like to hear also from you. Uh, what is your feeling about that? If you think we can work on this, then we can follow up by, by email, for instance, as we don't have much time here. I don't know, Peter, if you have any, any, any comment on this, if you think it is, can, can, this can be worked or, or we need further discussion on that. Unmute, Pete, unmute. <sighs> Uh, you cannot unmute. Oh, sorry. Filippo, if I can compliment, compliment for um, good evening to everybody and good morning <laughs> to you in the Pacific. Um, we can uh, use policy briefs as uh, not only for getting projects, but also eventually to stimulate the development of new laws and legislation on soil, or we can shape them around your needs to, to get where you want. Uh, but this, of course, depends on the reality in your region. Maybe you don't have the need to raise the awareness of your government on the need to protect soils or to have better legislations on soil. So this is just a proposal that uh, Filippo is moving on behalf of the GSP, building on the experience of the other regional soil partnerships. So, you are welcome to tell us uh, your opinion on it. Uh, sorry, Peter, we, we are you very bad, actually. <laughs> I think this is an issue with your, with your microphone, I don't know. Can you try maybe to write in the chat? I don't know. Can you, can you hear now? Okay. Yeah. Kind of better. Kind of better. Sorry. I don't know what. okay. What's going on? Um, <laughs> so I guess the issue for us here is um, the, the big difference across the region between um, where the countries sit with all of this. So it's very hard to make um, broad statements on behalf of the Pacific because we have countries like Australia with a very, very strong national soils policy and a national advocate, and it's right up there as key priorities at the moment. So um, the assistance to the other countries um, like Nui, places that don't have soil policy would be really supported, I guess, but uh, together we, we struggle to be able to come together and discuss these things in an appropriate time. And maybe it's again after the redevelopment of the uh, framework for the actions under the GSP that we could make some consideration of how to go forward as a region, including this sort of activity. Uh, thanks, Peter. So, uh... I'm not 100% sure that I uh, I got your message because of the of the audio uh, issues. Uh, if I got it right, you suggest to um, follow up the discussion after the plenary meeting of the GSP, and uh, this I mean the development of the of policy briefs can be an option, but we should take into consideration the variety, of, of course, uh, of even of priorities for different countries according to their. A position in the region and size, of course, because of course, uh, maybe I know just to make an example, uh, Pacific Islands may have different priorities and needs according to Australia and New Zealand, also in terms of policy that are already been developed and uh, the need of awareness maybe has different degrees according uh, of the considered countries. So maybe we can kind of group together countries which share the same kind of needs and the same kind of, uh, of threats. So maybe we can group them together uh, and, and work on policy briefs, grouping together uh, certain countries. But I see Siwa, uh, you have the hands up. Maybe you want to, to intervene? Yeah, Filippo, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I think with the, with the Pacific Islands, uh, to target together legislation is probably the last thing that farmers would want to get to. But the, the, before you get to the policy brief, I think with regards to soil management, 
because soil is a big issue in the Pacific, the first step is probably to develop guidelines. So I think guidelines is, is, is a must. And our work in, um, in the Pacific in KJWA, it was very clear from all the countries that they would like to have guidelines that leads to policy brief. We, we, we sort of not so much into legislations because we, that, that is a politician's uh, uh, zone. So getting to, to develop uh, guidelines and, and get to policy brief is probably what we, we, we need in, 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 the, in the islands right now. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ewa and Lili. Uh, we should think about priorities. And uh, if the others agree, uh, maybe your proposal is to focus first on um, on material for farmers, basically, basically guidelines for farmers. And as Lucrezia is suggesting in the chat, this is strongly linked with the with the soil doctors program that my colleague Silvia just presented. Uh, so maybe yes. we may. Uh, I think that that will be the first the first uh, step to to take now. Okay, so my, your proposal is to first focus on that and 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 join the force on working on the guidelines for farmers and these kind of programs. Uh, so maybe we can follow up later on because I think this should be done in parallel somehow because we cannot, uh, according also to the experience of other regions, we should try to keep all levels involved now. So not only the first, of course, working with the farmers, but also do not uh, oversee the, the importance of raised awareness through this document because they really can support and, and, and allow countries to better develop policies to, to support the implementation then on the guidelines for farmers. So these kind of, a compl a, there is, these are kind of complementing, complementing uh, initiatives somehow. So we can follow up later, maybe by email uh, later uh, this year and see, uh, yeah, I, I think we, I think especially we can, if there is a need, yeah. I think we can do that, but I want to, 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 to make an example that we do not want this to happen is that in my work around the Pacific, there are some islands, they have legislation banning the use of inorganic fertilizers and inorganic pesticides. When you go right back to the root of the things and how it was developed, there was no substantiated reasoning. That's why we would prefer to go through uh, guidelines. So that when you get to the legislation, legislation has been built on some firm foundation. There are legislation spanning fertilizers and inorganic pesticides in the Pacific. The foundation is, is very shaky. Thank you. Filippo, if I can um, yeah. to adapt to the situation of the region. If there is not the need to work on policymakers first or at all, let's support farmers and uh, um, the focal points are suggesting. So maybe uh, if, uh, well, Silvia, please, if you feel like intervening, please do it. If we can maybe link uh, this proposal to write guidelines uh, to the soil doctor programs that I think it's the best place to support on this. And maybe also link into the implementation of the protocol on sustainable soil management law. Um, then we, we just, uh, well, we don't duplicate efforts in my opinion. And then we leave the policy brief that is something different from uh, what is being proposed here from SUA uh, for a later stage if needed. Because my understanding is that as SUA and Peter were saying, um, maybe countries are already advanced on this and we need to develop other tools first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I agree. Sina, what do you think? Yes, yes, no. The, I think that it's a good, uh, chance to combine the effort in this case, yes. Uh, I think it is feasible, Lucrezia. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yes, I was just referring to the message that uh, Vili wrote in the chat about the, that uh, there are some, some examples from countries that already developed policy briefs and they took uh, many benefits from that. Uh, so maybe I agree, let's first work on, on, on these guidelines and to, further explore the implementation of uh, the possibility to implement soil doctor programs in the region. Uh, but at a certain stage, maybe we can investigate, maybe even through an online survey about the need first of awareness raising material, 
and they need to develop policy briefs because uh, I can, some countries in the Pacific, I think they really have uh, experience on that. Some may not, some may see benefits, some may not. So maybe we can follow up first, testing the ground and, and check if there is this, this kind of need and, and, and willingness. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Good. Uh, so thanks for your, uh, for, for your comments. I don't know if, uh, ah, really, if you want to implement because you, you wrote uh, this nice comment in the chat about, the, I think you have experience in that. And Poi also raised this end. Poi, yeah, in the meantime, you want, if you want to take the floor, Mr. Rukhesene. Yeah, thank you, uh, Philip. And uh, I'd just like to echo um, some some support uh, towards uh, some of the comments by Dr. Shiwa at this point in time. I think it's really important um, to, to that we have a, a simple tool and also a, a good uh, practical solution for uh, for the farmers in the entirety and also uh, for those around the Pacific. I noted that uh, we all have uh, different um, challenges and different situations and with regards to, to where we are at this point in time. But, but also I think uh, there's no harm in, in, in having policy briefs and working in tandem uh, with, um, and, and also with the guidelines, but I think the guidelines are much more, uh, it's more of a, a practical solution uh, at this point and, uh, and, and, and easy to implement across uh, many of the Pacific Island uh, countries. Um, and, and, and I guess uh, if there's an opportunity to address all the, the gaps, uh, I know that uh, we all have uh, different gaps and where, where each country is at, uh, at, at, le uh, at which level, then we will also be able to draw uh, on, on, on similar needs like you have proposed uh, in terms of uh, uh, putting together countries who have similar needs uh, moving forward and, uh, and also similar priorities. So I'd just like to add that um, into the conversation at this point. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot because indeed the big variety across the region maybe also uh, a kind of an obstacle to develop uh, a policy brief and identify uh, common challenges and common needs. Uh, Vili, I see uh, your reader end. Can you please, uh, because I don't remember from which country you're from, can you please specify? Hello, everyone. Ah, um, okay. This is what Vili <laughs> looks like. <laughs> yeah, I'm, um, um, I'm, I work here at the University of Pacific. Um, I'm originally a Samoan, a citizen of Tuvalu, but now living in Fiji. Um, so I'm from the Pacific uh, Islands, Philip. Um, yeah, uh, I just want to, um, to, to, to make uh, two quick uh, points. I was, uh, I was uh, mentioning the experience with policy briefs um, because uh, uh, we have written a lot of them, but they were not about soil. I think that is one important thing uh, to, to note there. Uh, they were mainly about the resilience um, building and um, uh, nature-based solutions and things like that. It's because they already have very good information in those fields. Uh, so there is experience of getting policy briefs. And I think it's important to, to map out as well the purpose and, um, and the framing of those policy briefs as alluded to earlier. And I think I, I also, the second point is that uh, I, I support what uh, Asiwa mentioned as well as uh, Poi, because uh, for, for doing a policy brief for soil, we must also provide uh, those strong evidence and also um, provide those standards and guidelines in order to entice the interest. Because the main question that will come will be why. Uh, if we have to do a policy brief, we have to answer the question why. It's not just about what. And in order to answer why, we have to um, say that because we need to do this, 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 because of this reason, this, 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 this. And I think, um, so to build a house, we need to build the foundation first, uh, to build uh, the wall and then build it upward. And I think uh, she was suggested that uh, very well to get the guidelines and get the evidence based from the, from the ground up in order to entice the, um, the appetite of, um, of the policymakers and then and the donors and, uh, and so forth. So 
um, it's it's a good opportunity um, to uh, to look at getting those policies and those information, and it's also a very good opportunity to to work together to, to get those guidelines. So when it gets to the legislation, we know how to enforce it. Um, because uh, as you were mentioned, we do have a lot of legislations and it's frustrating. From one side, there is a legislation, it says not to do this. And on the other hand, everyone is doing the opposite of what the legislation says, but then um, it's the problem with enforcement. So yeah, I just wanted to, to, to highlight that. Thank you very much. Nah. Thanks again to you. I um, mean, that was very clear. And I think we all agree with, with your statement. Uh, and I, I think Lucrezia really summarized it very well in the, in the chat. So maybe let's first develop guidelines for farmers first. And then once we uh, work on the ground and we collect evidence, as you mentioned, and we, we, so we retrieve data, we can then work on policy briefs. Uh, and, and, and she's suggesting we can maybe present the document that will be produced uh, in, a, in, in a major event in the region, um, maybe attended by those people who are targeted by the policy briefs or policymakers. Um, so we'll start by gatherings for farmers and then we'll uh, eventually explore the possibility to develop such document. So thanks again uh, to Vili, Siwa, uh, Peter and, and, and everyone for the, for the discussion. Uh, I think the next one, um, the next presentation in, in, in the agenda, unless there is any, any other comments on this, is with uh, my colleague Isabel Watto, but I will leave the floor to Lucrezia to moderate from now onwards, please. Thank you, Filippo, for moderating this uh, first part of the meeting. I'm sorry for my look, I'm, I'm a little bit sick, <laughs> but I'm happy to be with you. So good, good morning, everybody again. As Filippo mentioned, I would like to give the floor to my colleague Isabel Otto to, to go a bit deeper no, in what I presented yesterday on soil data and information. So Isabel, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Lucrezia, and thank you, Filippo. And uh, good morning, participants of the meeting, and uh, good morning to the colleagues uh, as uh, we are reaching uh, already the, the morning, let's say, for, for us. Um, so as Lucrezia was uh, uh, anticipating, I will be providing a little bit more information regarding uh, the activities and the progress on the area of work of soil information and uh, data, formerly known as Pillar 4. And um, Lucrezia already presented some part of it, and I will be going a little bit more into detail in my presentation. Um, since I'm going to uh, mention quite some emails and also Google Forms that are linked in this presentation, uh, I would ask uh, Lucrezia or Filippo if it's okay, if I can just directly share the link to this presentation in the chat so that uh, everyone has already uh, the links to, to the, well, the emails and the forms that I will be mentioning. So uh, here in this first slide, you can see the overall progress of the various global products that have been launched over the years, always following the country-driven approach that was uh, initiated and implemented first for the Global Soil Organic Carbon Map back in 2017. And this map really set uh, the basis for the country-driven approach that uh, basically represents the maxim of what we do uh, with soil information and data. So we don't work following a top-down approach, but we really value um, bridging technical divides, working directly with countries so to uh, allow them or to give them access uh, to methodologies uh, that they can make their own to produce national products, to build upon the methodologies and to contribute then ultimately to global products that allow for transboundary analysis. This uh, process is not perfect uh, since uh, it fulfills two daunting tasks. So uh, answering questions at the global scale, uh, but also um, 
scaling up methodologies that have to deal with uh, very different data and computational realities. But the nice thing about this country-driven approach is that uh, it's made possible by working directly with the countries, by working directly with the INC network, um, the uh, International Network of Science Information Institutions to uh, create living products that can be improved throughout time. So we uh, are currently working on also improving the GSOC map. We're working on improving the Global Soil Organic Carbon Sequestration Potential Map, which was launched recently. Uh, and we are perpetuating this country-driven process also for the other products. I will focus uh, a bit on uh, the Global Soil Organic Carbon Sequestration Potential Map. Uh, you already saw it in small in Carolina's presentation. And I think you will notice something uh, very uh, stark when it comes to the Pacific region. Uh, there is no data, there, is no, uh, there are no national maps from this uh, region to date. This is the current uh, submission status of the GSOC SEC. Uh, you can see in green the submitted maps, uh, in red the not submitted maps that uh, have been partially gap filled through globally available data sets. And then in yellow, you can see, uh, well, in various shades of yellow, you can see maps that are currently in progress uh, that uh, we know we're currently working closely with or uh, that are currently being created under other projects. And then you see here that we currently don't have uh, submissions for the Pacific region. And this is definitely something that we would like to improve. And, uh, initiate, let's say, a dialogue to, to work together. Um, just to provide a little bit more background on the GSOC-SEC, uh, the main uh, reasons for the GSOC-SEC, uh, for it to be initiated, were the needs to set attainable and evidence-based national targets for carbon sequestration. So provide a mechanism for countries to set evidence-based data-driven uh, targets for carbon sequestration when it comes to sustainable soil management. Identify areas that have high soil sequestration potential for the uh, implementation of sustainable soil management projects. And then uh, what I was also mentioning earlier, enhance national capacities. There are countries uh, like also Australia, for instance, that are quite advanced. Uh, when it comes to estimating SOC sequestration potential. And uh, we see this process uh, as a means or as a way to uh, bridge technical divides globally. So to scale up uh, based on the example and the experience of other countries and give access to these methodologies to, to other countries as well. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, um, both the GSOC map and the GSOC SEC uh, there are plans to further improve these uh, products, and we're currently working on a concept note uh, in which we're going to combine these improvements of the GSOC map, which sets the basis for the GSOC SEC uh, to be included. And for this purpose, we have uh, established a working group, an open call was sent to INSEE uh, to participate in this working group with the dual uh, objective of, con of contributing to key GSOC-SEC uh, publications. We want the GSOC-SEC to be represented in a high impact journal and to consolidate uh, a way forward in form of this concept note. Uh, more information uh, will be shared uh, as soon as we have finalized it. So for the current status of the GSOC-SEC when focusing on the Pacific, um, some work was, uh, or some um, dialogue was initiated with some of the countries at the beginning of the process, as some national experts were um, selected, either by the focal points or the INSEE members, and some countries have uh, officially requested to remain blank for this first version of the GSOC-SEC. However, I hope that uh, in the future uh, we can initiate a dialogue again and work together um, 
so that we can, can improve the, the GSOC sec as it is a, a living product. For the other countries uh, here, you will see in this slide a link to a form. This is uh, specifically aimed at the INSEE members and the focal point. If you're interested in participating in this activity, I would be uh, very grateful on behalf of the SOL information and data team if you could uh, nominate a national expert for this activity. For the other countries um, that would like to know more also, if you, are, uh, if you didn't hear about this working group and you would like to know more and participate, please feel free to just uh, write me directly via email. Uh, for the other countries and the national experts that I mentioned earlier, if you would like to pick up again this activity, please reach out to me directly to either report on progress or seek technical support. Now to the global salt affected SOLS map. Uh, in, for this uh, product, we have indeed some submissions uh, for the Pacific and um, some maps were already submitted and uh, a capacity development uh, uh, activity, let's say in form of a regional training was already organized back in 2020. To date, uh, six countries have submitted maps to the GSAS map. Um, this is the list of countries that submitted. If uh, you are a country that has nominated a national expert uh, and would like to seek uh, further technical support or report on progress on this activity, the key contact person for this product is uh, Cristiano Muto, my colleague uh, at the GSP. And again, just feel free to directly contact him via email. A recent uh, uh, map that is about to be launched soon is the global black soil distribution map. Here on this um, slide, you can see some uh, background regarding uh, black soils, the world's most productive and fertile soils. Um, and in order to map their spatial distribution uh, a, an activity, to launch the global black soil distribution map was uh, initiated and a, an international training was uh, already organized for specifically the INBS member countries uh, to map their in, in, uh, distribution. If you would like to join the INBS network, the International Network on Black Soils, your key contact person is my colleague Yushin Tong. Uh, just feel free again to contact him directly. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, an international training has been delivered alongside a technical manual. Uh, and a global report on the status of black soils uh, is being produced and will be delivered by the end of May. Here in the slide, you can also see some interesting results. So we are currently working uh, on a dashboard that uh, will be part of the GSP website where you can see some at glance uh, statistics uh, regarding the black soils. All these activities are made possible by the International Network of Soil Information Institutions known as INSI. Uh, INSI has three key functions. It helps us nominate, identify and nominate national experts to support uh, the implementation of the various soil information and data activities. They provide access to soil geographic information in order to pro, uh, populate the products of the global soil information system. And they support the overall process. They make it possible by providing uh, their technical expertise uh, for the implementation of the various activities. Here uh, on this slide, you can see a uh, link to, uh, well, first of all, a spreadsheet uh, that shows uh, the current contacts that we have for INSEE. Uh, I would invite you to check this spreadsheet to see if uh, the contacts are still up to date, if the emails and the contact person for the INSEE uh, member is uh, correct. 
Then down here, you see a, a list of countries that still have to nominate their experts for INSEE. Uh, I would highly invite you to do so by using this form that you see here at the end of this slide. And uh, this is it for my part. I thank you very much for your attention. And again, um, if you have any question uh, for the various global products, you see the various emails listed there. And also if you would like to have further clarifications regarding the activities, uh, I'm always available via email. Thank you very much. I don't know if there is already some question for you. Um, if so, I kindly invite the participants to raise their hand or take the floor or write in the chat. Okay, I see uh, maybe a, a comment by Peter. Uh, he's having connection issues. Okay, uh, uh, Australia will, yeah. will be undertaking a GSOC. That, that is great news and uh, uh, we are looking forward to working with you. So um, I guess we can uh, um, proceed and coordinate to maybe organize a meeting. Ah, uh, you're having audio problems. Yeah, your voice is so funny when you try to speak, Peter. We can't understand, but it's so excellent. It's, um, <laughs> my best Italian. Is that <laughs> any better or no? No, yes, it's slightly better. Yeah, I have all sorts of issues with my stuff here. So, um, yeah, thank you. Interesting to see again the uh, the presentation of global products um, here. I, yeah, if you're very keen to know more about the Black Soils map, because when you look for Australia, that's just a very bad representation of Black Soils down here. Which you, again, just highlighting this issue of um, global production of products that don't come from country up. So I'll talk to uh, Eugene. I think it was around who did that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Isa, you will be following up with Peter directly, right? Okay. Now, because of time's sake, um, I would like to move to the next presentation. If you remember yesterday, I've been talking about the Global Soil Laboratory Network and its regional soil laboratory network. And in the Pacific, we have ASPAC. So I kindly invite uh, Rob De Heyer to present uh, on ASPAC. Rob, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, and thanks very much for the opportunity. I'm just sharing my screen and making sure that that's correct. Is that right? All good? OK. Um, so as um, Peter alluded to yesterday, um, the last couple of years have been quite difficult, particularly in the lab uh, scene uh, across the region uh, due to the COVID. A lot of labs have been closed, not operating, and staff have been unavailable. Um, and also uh, managers of laboratories have been more focused on managing their own, um, own facilities rather than uh, looking, looking outwards to to what was going on either regionally, nationally, or regionally, or even globally. And to that end, we've been probably the quietest two years of activity in ASPAC that I can remember. In as also Lucretia alluded to, the 30 years that ASPAC's been around. And just a, a quick um, reminder of, of who ASPAC is. Again, um, we already existed. So when Glossolan came looking for the um, uh, creation of a, a, a regional um, network in, a, in the Pacific, it was silly to um, duplicate something that has already existed since 1990. And we uh, have membership of uh, corporate membership of laboratories, uh, individuals and students. And ASPAC is overseen by executive committee uh, of jurisdictional representation. So we have representation from each state in Australia, from New Zealand. And as of a year or so ago, 
we included a, a representative from the Pacific Islands, um, Muhammad Abdul Qadir from USP and Samoa campus uh, has done a great job uh, trying to catch up with uh, where we are. Um, ASPAC also has a few subcommittees, uh, the Laboratory Proficiency uh, Committee, which runs the Interlaboratory Proficiency Trial across the region. We have a Methods Committee who looks at uh, researching and improving uh, methods and updating methods with uh, new technologies. We also offer travel awards and we are represented on what the FERT Care um, uh, Committee in conjunction with Fertiliser Australia uh, look, and uh, looking at uh, improving uh, fertiliser uh, analysis and use and um, soil, uh, soil sampling and quite a few other topics that um, of interest to both uh, the fertiliser industry and the yeah, soil laboratory industry. So as PAC aims, I'll quickly go through, I'll probably just uh, jump across this, we can look this up uh, to the time, but basically we're here to help facilitate the harmonisation of soil data through uh, promoting better laboratory practice. Um, you'll see there's 77 laboratories from the Pacific, from nine countries that are um, currently uh, registered with, with Glosalyn. You'll see the big jump in uh, December 2020 when it was agreed that all ASPAC members would automatically become Glosalyn, uh, registered with Glosalyn. So all of a sudden, um, 50 or 60 laboratories that are, were ASPAC members automatically were registered with, um, with Glosalyn. So it's, it's a considerable amount, and it's fair to say that most of those laboratories are in. In, on the Australian continent. Um, over 2021, we had our annual general meeting um, in December. And also in December, we ran a, a specific laboratories meeting. And um, the results of that um, will come up in a little bit later. So what are some of the initiatives that we've, um, we've tried to get uh, going in the last uh, couple of years. We sent out a survey to Pacific Labs uh, just to find out what they feel we could be doing to uh, assist them. Um, we are aware that there was a um, initiative started to support uh, the development of laboratories in Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands. And I've got a question mark on that, but uh, we've haven't been able to uh, find out where that um, initiative has got to and how far along the um, the line of the project uh, has developed. Um, we've worked with stakeholders to leverage financial support, so we're we're in consultation, although sporadically, with uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia and Ministry for Foreign Affairs in in New Zealand, ACR. Uh, land care research and the SPC. And of course, that's always an ongoing activity uh, trying to um, uh, get funding for some of the activities that we want to, um, we would like to uh, achieve in the Pacific. So because we have, um, over the last couple of years, it's been very quiet. The ASPAC executive has decided to hold a strategic planning meeting early this year. Um, and looking at uh, developing one, two, one, three, and five-year work plans based on the regional member needs, and uh, and identifying mentors and champions to be able to implement some of those activities. Um, obviously, whatever comes out of that strategic planning meeting will be pa uh, passed through the members of, of ASPAC for comment and um, hopefully some ideas on on implementation before it's uh, released as a strategic uh, plan. Um, we've also uh, supporting the implementation of the Australian National Soil Strategy, uh, particularly in the laboratory and soil analysis um, parts of it, uh, and particularly in, in carbon 
uh, analysis. Papa, uh, Peter and I have a, a yet to sit down and, and finalise the proposed regional spectroscopy plenary early this year for the region. Um, I'm sure we'll get around to that uh, at some stage. And um, I just want to uh, make note that the, um, it's been advised that the 17th International Symposium on Soil and Plant Analysis uh, will be held in 2023 um, in Santiago, Chile, but it will also have a virtual uh, platform as well. Um, I think the last one I went to was in China in 2009. Uh, 19, and I think um, there was over 700 delegates at it. So it's a big, it's a big, um, it's, a, it's a big thing, and it's been going for quite some time. As I said, the 17th it's held every four years. Um, we had uh, reported on the uh, the potential of revision of soil chemical methods to Australasia, and unfortunately, that revision is still uh, due to. Um, uh, issues between the authors and the publishers in coming to a, an agreement on the contract. Um, so um, we we hope we can help to facilitate uh, an answer to those issues. And as I said before, um, from that uh, book that um, was published in 2011, um, there's been a revision of what I what we call the, the SPACnet. Uh, method manual that um, Mohamed Adil Kadir, um, Kader, sorry, um, um, uh, produced. He did a fantastic job. And while it took some time to, for ASPAC members to review it, um, there wasn't anything really significant to make changes to the document that he um, that he actually produced. So the reason for that is that um, if you've seen the um, the publication, the, the Soil Chemical Methods Australasia, um, affectionately known as the Green Book, you'll um, you'll know that um, the structure and the style is based on trying to make the book as short as possible, rather than having clear, understandable instructions. Uh, as it is a reference book, not necessarily a standard operating procedure. So taking it into a more user-friendly uh, version for, um, for laboratory staff in the Pacific um, was a really good idea and done very well by, by CADA. So what have we been doing actually for Pacific Labs? Well, um, ASPAC has sponsored them. Um, as you might realize that um, our uh, corporate members, our laboratories, uh, pay a fee, which um, supports a lot of activities um, that ASPAC um, try and uh, do. Uh, we have 11 uh, laboratories sponsored uh, for, uh, from the Pacific Islands. Uh, the Interlaboratory Proficiency Program is a very, very important part of, the, of, um, of ASPAC's operation. Uh, we have clear evidence and statistical evidence of over time of just laboratories being involved in the interlaboratory efficiency program, seeing that the coefficients of variation in each individual analysis have dropped by more than 60% um, over the 15 year period, uh, which only goes to say that in general across the board, the performance of laboratories in doing soil analysis has improved by probably 60 or 70 percent, which is a really good news. And that's just from sheer participation. Um, even though training and, and education is important, we found probably the best value um, we get is by laboratories being in, involved in a laboratory proficiency program. And we were lucky enough now to have ACR come on board to uh, support the, the laboratories that, um, that can't afford to be involved in that program. So unfortunately, only two labs have participated in the first round this year. Um, and there was really not enough participation in 2020 and 2021 
to give a, a really good um, account of the performance across all labs. Um, some labs only um, um, prefer, performed or participated in one um, round instead of the three, some labs two, some labs three, some labs not at all. So um, having a, a conversation about the general um, per, uh, performance of labs across was, was uh, fraught with danger, so I decided not to bother. Um, and mainly, uh, and, and some of the issues with participation is due to some of the changes in biosecurity rules in some of the countries have, have really tightened and some of the costs for importing soil samples have increased significantly to the stage where actually um, we're sending uh, all three rounds, uh, all, all three rounds for the year to the laboratories in one shipment to try and save on, um, on costs for those laboratories to be able to import the, the sample. We're hoping that they don't do them all at once, but hoping that they do them at the appropriate, appropriate times, but um, that's, that's the way it is. But unfortunately, we only only received um, lab. I have a, a report saying some of the labs are only receiving their samples now uh, for the first round uh, because of those um, holdups. And also, you know, with labs closing due to COVID and staff unavailability due to the fact that they're either isolating or unable to attend work. It also impacted pretty severely on our 2020 and 2021 training schedule. We like to hold our training in person so that we can have um, proper communication and proper dialogue between, between people and actually be able to demonstrate things in person. And um, so we, and as I said before, a lot of the um, members of the executive are pretty busy trying to deal with managing the issues within their own laboratories um, through those problems. Oh, what's happened? Uh, so, Dalva, Adam, I'm sorry, um, can I ask you to please get to the end because uh, um, yep, late. I can finish off. Sorry. I can finish. I can finish off now. Um, so sorry. So one of the one of the important results of the survey was that um, did anyone think that this regional network was was important? Yes, and the answer was everybody said that it was extremely important. So I won't go through the results any more results due to time, but they'll be on the um, on the um, presentation uh, when you want to uh, if you look it up. I'll leave it there, Lucretia. That's it. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, 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 you're <laughs> right. I, I, I knew I was going to be in trouble. Yeah, um, no, I knew I was going to be in trouble. So I was waiting for your, <laughs> no, your dulcet so tones sorry. to come across. <sighs> no, thank before. you so much for your presentation. I don't know if there is uh, any burning question for Rob uh, that maybe can also be asked uh, in the chat. As you can see, we are not really giving space for making proposals for new activities under the five pillars of actions because of what uh, Ronald, but also like Filippo has been saying uh, uh, throughout the meeting, so that uh, there will be a restyling of the GSP, let's say, so that we will move out of pillars. So that's why we are not giving space to discuss like pillar specific activities. But uh, uh, it's more likely that uh, we will start talking about uh, topic specific activities. Uh, so in order to close this agenda item, I would like to make a proposal because uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, this year and during this meeting, we should also be discussing about the governance of the Pacific Soil Partnership. Um, so there was the point of re-electing the pillars chairs and uh, I think uh, also the, um, the Regional Soil Partnership uh, Chair, uh, right, Peter? I think, uh, I think so. Uh, so I make a proposal <laughs> also looking at what the other regions agreed on, at least the Near East and North Africa and Asia, that uh, we organize another very brief meeting after the GSP plenary assembly to discuss about the governance of the regions so that we can have a better idea of how the Global Soil Partnership is evolving 
um, and we decide if we need of uh, chairs for topic specific activities. We will make the election of the new uh, chair of the of the partnership, uh, and uh, we will discuss also maybe a bit better the activities that you would like to implement as a region based on the new GST framework. So out of the pillars. So today we just discuss. Uh, Indeed, the, the, the proposal, and we made actually the proposal to have these guidelines for farmers, but maybe during this time, so from now to let's say June, so right after the plenary, uh, you can come up with other ideas, you can discuss with each other to see, uh, especially also the, the islands, no? the Pacific countries. Um, if uh, you have similarities that lead you to propose uh, uh, activities to the GSP to implement or to other partners in the region to implement. So this is my proposal. Uh, you are welcome to propose anything better. <laughs> or, um, I don't know. Peter, yeah, the question, yeah, I think I think that's good as we discussed in emails earlier on that um, we're certainly in need of some um, new energy within the PSP um, and I apologize again to everybody for my lack of ability to really engage as strongly as I would have hoped. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're all in the same position which is good because it means we're all doing lots of work um, but I agree with you that after the plenary and we know what the new form of the GSP is then we should come together review our action plan and how we how we deal with it. So I would support that. Thank you very much. I see it's a comment also in the chat. So uh, let's stick on this. We talk again after the plenary, let's say in June. Short meeting only about the governance and action plan of the partnership. Now, I'm sorry we are late, uh, but at least the, the, the presentation on the status of the workshop resources will be very brief. Uh, now I would like to give uh, the floor to Stua to present about the collaboration with the Coronavian Joint Work on Agriculture. Stua, the floor is yours. I'm sorry that you have little time to present. The shorter you can keep it, the better. I'm very sorry because I'm afraid that people will leave due to other commitments. Oh, that's all right. I will, uh, I will rush. You'll have to help me quick and uh, slight movement. That's all right. Okay. So, Filippo. Filippo, can you put up the slide, please? I'm so sorry, Sua. <laughs> I'm afraid that people would have other commitments like yesterday. Tap in. Okay, thank you, Philip. I think the introduction slide is just about Pacific position on the future of the Coronavirus Joint Work on Agriculture. And I have a subtitle there that uh, I think the Pacific have done a lot, but what is reported is disappointing in the fact that we has been it's reported around the world that we are doing very little. Uh, to the contrary, we are doing quite a lot. Next slide, please. Okay, this, this slide is simply in the region. Coupled with it, the, the, the rainfall in some places are increasing is so much, some, some are, are decreasing. Sea level rise is a real issue in some countries like around Kiribati and Tuvalu. The actual sea level rise is more than the world average. And cyclone, the frequency is lesser, but the intensity is much, much more. In the last 10 years, our cyclones have been mostly category five. So that is the climate change in availability in the Pacific. Next slide. 
So I just want to, to share with this. This is a, a saying from one of our Pacific statesmen who about adaptation. Adaptation ensures that we as a people are prepared and resilient enough to survive through impacts of climate change with our culture, resources and identity intact for generations to come. So that encapsulates what the Pacific is all about. We want to step with everything that we have. That's why in sometimes when people are going to be refugees in Australia, they always ask, are we going to be Australians or will we be called refugee from Giribas in Australia? Okay, continue. Next slide, please. Well, this is just a, a, an example of, of what we can do. And we have developed a, a manual on vulnerability analysis to climate change. And based on on the on the equation vulnerability equal exposure times sensitivity divided by adaptive capacity. I'm not going to go through this, but it shows that our exposure is quite high. Sensitivity is also in the higher range, and our adaptive capacity is not very very convincing. So in 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 a sense that our vulnerability, most of the Pacific, as this example says, is quite high. Can you press for the for um, there's a, a red thing there, uh, please. Uh, yeah. So the question here is, how can we continue to intensify food production and yet maintain sustainability of the production systems of the Pacific Island in the face of climate change? This is throughout the Pacific, despite our environmental differences from atolls right up to high islands. Next one, please. So the, the answer is we, we need to go climate change and I, to go climate smart agriculture. Of course, the premises of climate smart agriculture is improve productivity, improve resilience, while at the same time reducing greenhouse gas emissions. There are some here, you will get the, the slides of what we, we mean by weather smart, seed smart, grid smart, Newton carbon smart, institutional and market smart. Next slide, please. Next slide, yep. So this, this slide I want to share because this is in particular atolls like Kiribati, Tuvalu, we are not able to, to, to present. But I think if there is something from the atolls that we want to share, it's what we, we coined targeted compost. Targeted compost is de developing recipe that addresses the soils of atolls are, are uh, limiting in at least say five newtons, NPK, sometimes copper, manganese, uh, iron, and you know this boron. You know this these are multiple nutrient deficiency. So the, what we have done in on atoll is look for ingredients that when you make the compost, you are targeting these these nutrient deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the work, the research, how it's applied to the two mm -hmm. food systems in in there. The, the the rain fed and the system where where the in the, they call papai pit they take a pit and then they, they grow the food around it next one please yeah the, the next one is is use of magic bean we have been talking a lot about about mm -hmm. mukuna uh, please next one please because uh, this one is animated I I need the next slide. See, this is studies we have done in the Pacific to show how much nitrogen a, a six-month crop of uh, of uh, mukuna can 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 supply. It's only it's about 50 to 60 kilograms per, per hectare. Next one, please. And we didn't know that mukuna is one of those wonders. That's why I call it magic beans. It it also mobile, it also contributes. Sorry. Oh, you for meeting today, Mr. Benjamin. So next one, please. Next one, please. Yeah, and then we, when we did the beef fractionation, you see that, that Mukuna are able to mobilize the iron and aluminum phosphate fractions in the soil. That is something I wanted to share here. Next one, please. And, and in the fallow system, you can see the Mukuna is much better than the traditional grass fallow. Next. And this is a study of one of our students in Samoa showing how 
labile carbon from Mukuna is doing much better than than others. Okay, so that's that's in brief of the of that. The next one, please. Yeah, then of course we have to in our in in our country, especially like adults, we have to be water smart. And these are just some of the things that have been promoted around the Pacific. The kind of irrigation using drinking water bottles, bucket irrigation. At the top is uh, coir from coconut that we are introducing into the compost. And then the bottom left, that is a wicking system. And then bottom right is, is using mulches in, on atolls to grow um, taro. Next one, please. Yeah, and, and I see Rohit is there, but I wanted to bring two slides from Rohit's uh he was supposed to present yesterday and that is we are we are pushing the front of agriculture in the pacific especially taro on, on in taveuni where rohit is and you can see there the amount of of soil erosion that can happen on these hills that have been turned into taro next one please and that is what rohit is doing in in a comp combining vetiver grass with uh contour barriers to Double row pineapple. I think this is a good piece of work. And unfortunately, it didn't fit into the, the Fiji presentation yesterday. Next one, please. Yeah, I think this is something that is really, really important in the Pacific. When you talk to and to environmentalists and climate change people, they talk about biodiversity. And when you ask them, they only talk about what they see, the above ground biodiversity. They don't talk about the below ground biodiversity. And we just had a global so, uh, symposium on soil biodiversity. And I think it is so important that to, to, be, to, be, to, be, to make a balance so that environmentalists can realize that without below ground biodiversity, the above ground biodiversity will suffer. And I think this is an important thing in the Pacific right now. Next one, please. Yeah, I think this is this is so important. We have, there is a huge volume of study around the world and around the Pacific on climate change, but very little on correlation between climate change and invasive peasant diseases. Mind you, a lot of our peasant diseases they live in the soil, so we must also look at invasive species as relations to to the soil. And I think uh, FAO and SPC are looking at developing a GCF project in, in this. But this is very, very important in the Pacific because one of the biggest problems with our agriculture is, is now the transboundary invasive peasant diseases. Next one. Yeah, and I think we need to, to understand that the equation won't be complete if we do not try and make use of, of long-term weather data. This is just a, a, an example of the, the Southwest Tropical Cyclone outlook for the Pacific for 2020, 20, end of 2020 to 21, and the number of cyclones, and then some probability for some of the, the places in Tonga. But right now, so I have a group of commercial farmers that I am in their WhatsApp group. And the, the interesting thing about these farmers, the Nishi trading farmers, they are so interested in, in using their, their mobile phone and, and looking at weather data. So we always, if they have, we said, okay, we share the, the next 10 days weather forecast. So I think we are heading in the, in the right direction in, in that case, but it's using long-term weather data is very important. Next one. Yeah, food waste. The amount of food waste is equivalent to a waste of, of some of our whole countries. And this food waste can be can add to the equation of improving soil organic carbon in, in the world. That's why I just put in this, this slide. Next one, please. Yeah, and the other one is, is methane and nitrous oxide. In under KJWA, we have been promoting the biogas digestion. Some of these photos are from Samoa and Kiribati, and also uh, N2O. Not only in in these in the animal systems uh, production, but related to the the, the un, 
unconscious use or in, in, uh, too much use of, of urea around the Pacific right now. Next one, please. Yeah, this is, this is, I think, the last slide. I want to look, uh, all of you to look at the square. The square, one side is agriculture and livestock, one side is forestry. In between is land use uh, changes and then the ecosystem services. These ones, when we mismanage, they produce emissions that causes climate change and impact our that system again. So when we talk about mitigation and adaptation and co-benefits, a lot of time we try to look at it inside there. The co-benefit is coming outside from that system. And a lot of our SDGs are our co-benefits. I'm not going to go through this because it's not enough time. But I think it will be very good to have a look at this diagram and see how we, we, we cause climate change and how we can, we can look at, at co-benefits of, of some of these things. Next one, please. I think I have two slides left. Next one, please. Yeah, we also do a lot of capacity building in the, in the region. And these are some of the areas we have, we have conducted. Uh, uh, we have developed a submission to, uh, to UNFCC and, and some of the webinars. I must share that most of the, our, our team in the Coronavirus Joint Work on Agriculture Network, most of them are our soil scientists and people working in soils in the, in, in the countries. And then uh, I think the last slide. Yeah, I think the last slide is to improve resilience and productivity of food systems in the Pacific and minimize greenhouse gas emission. These are some of the things that we must address. Improve biodiversity, improve soil management, increase soil organic carbon, reduce food loss, introduce trees. And when you mean trees, more permanent sink, not trees that we, we harvest from and kill. Agriculture must contribute to national determined contribution plans. Very few countries in the Pacific have agriculture in the NDCs. Most of the NDCs are energy driven. Improve water management. My new, I want to end up by saying most, most important factor in all this is the people. A lot of our adaptation projects coming into the Pacific forget the people. Why do, and when they fail, we, we trace back and realize that the community were not consulted in day one. If you want it to be successful, you must consult people in day one. Thank you. That is KZWA, and you can see KZWA in the Pacific is very much a soil-driven uh, activity in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sila. Is there any question, request for clarification, remark? Um, we will make all the presentations available on the website of the Pacific Soil Partnership. We will send you an email following this meeting. Uh, as a follow-up, indeed, we will send an email with the, all the contact person for the activities that were mentioned during the meeting, links to documents, links to presentation, also the link to the video recording of, uh, of the meeting so that you can go through it anytime. If there are no questions, I would like to quickly share my screen to uh, present. Can I just make uh, one comment, Lucrezia, please? Tell me. Just, just one comment quickly on, on, sure. on picking up on, on something that Siwa mentioned. Um, I think we need to be able to recognise all of this work that does happen around the region. Um, whilst we have the framework of the GSP, um, it, it's very difficult sometimes to fit within those those activities and recognise that those things are being done within that sort of framework because they are sometimes they they been they're happening all around the other way. So constantly, I think we've said throughout the GSP's history that at the plenary we need to be able to report on all of the soils related work, not just the stuff that has a GSP badge on it, and, and somehow recognise that and, and use the GSP to help coordinate and, and connect, uh, which is good, but, but still recognise the huge amount of work that everybody does. 
Brian, yes. thank you to see what it, it should going. be a two ways communication. So we don't like just to have this kind of top <laughs> down, you know, like average. So we hope really with the that with the new framework, GSP framework, we will be able to give also more visibility to what you are doing in the region now by putting it under the right topic, maybe so that we can also advertise it in the proper way to the proper proper audience. So let's see, yeah. let's see what will happen and let's talk about it uh, in um, in June. But indeed, congratulations for the amazing work you are doing on on this project. Um, as I was saying, um, please allow me to share my screen. My presentation will be very brief. It's about the, the second edition of the status of the War Soil Resources Report that I hope you all know. It's a publication that uh, um, was released in 2015. Uh, it has like a global, um, it presents like a, a global description of the status of soils. And then it also has uh, chapters with uh, regional perspectives. Um, right now we are working on the second edition with the support of the ITPS. And I, in this regard, I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Ms. Megan Boggs, that is the current ITPS representative for New Zealand. Her mandate is coming to the end, but she's also a member of the editorial board and the executive editorial board of uh, this publication. So as I mentioned, this is the second uh, edition of uh, the report that we released in 2015. And it will focus on new information information gathered in, in this period, so from 2015 to 2025. So we aim to assess uh, changes in the status, but also in the trends of soil. Uh, the primary audience of this publication is policymakers and other decision makers involved in sustainable soil management, but it's also a very important source of information for other stakeholders. Usually out of this publication, we also release a shorter version of it specific for policymakers. What is in this slide? Um, it's likely to change uh, following the decisions of uh, the, the last ITPS meeting. Uh, but uh, let's see that for the moment, this is the proposal of the editorial board on the way to, um, to tackle the, the issues related to soil in the publication. In the first edition of uh, the status of the War Soil Resources Report, we had 10 soil threats. In the second edition, the editorial board is proposing to work on eight risk to soil function that are the ones reported on screen. So soil erosion, soil, soil carbon change, soil biodiversity change, nutrient mismanagement, salinization and acidification, pollution, soil sealing and urbanization, and physical degradation that will include soil compaction. And these risks are linked to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. However, for the sake of, for the sake of making this report and the information in, its, uh, in this report comparable to what was released in 2015, um, this proposal is likely going to change so that we will stick to the soil, the 10 soil threats that were identified in 2015. But this is still a decision to be made. Um, the document has two main parts. Uh, the first part is an update on risk to soil function. The second part is, as I mentioned before, um, a focus on regional assessment of the status of soil in 2025. So really we will zoom in into this, the condition of soil in each region. Regional assessments will be carried out by panels of experts from each of the seven regions that were identified in the report. The regions that uh, will be identified, will, will be, let's say, discussed in 2000 in this report, so the 2025 report, will be the same that were in the report in 2015. And this is why we care of presenting this document here, because we will kindly ask towards the end of the year, more or less, uh, the support of experts from the Pacific Soil Partnership to write especially the regional assessment for the Pacific. 
the tentative structure of the expert panels, well, there will be the editorial board of the, of the ITPS that will collaborate with regional soil partnerships in the selection of the experts for each region. Again, here, uh, the editorial board is working on writing um, selection criteria for these experts so that uh, there is more or less balance also in terms of, um, of experience no? and expertise uh, between the different regions. And we can release something uh, that is more or less uh, um, at the same level in all regions. Um, the, the timetable for expert panels is, uh, um, a bit, is uh, like the one on screen. So from July to December 2022, we will establish the framework for expert panels and select members. In April 2023, um, and then uh, uh, until March 2024, we will do an assessment um, by the, the, the expert panels. And from April 2024 to September 2024, we will really start working and drafting the regional chapters by the staff and expert panels. Um, in this work, the GSP Secretariat will have like uh, an editorial role. We will support the uh, editorial board and the, um, the leading editor, the managing editor and we will look after the overall publication of, uh, of this report. Um, so as I mentioned, well, as anticipated from October 2024 to this December 2024, we will review and revise uh, the, the draft regional chapters. And then ultimately uh, from January to March 2025, the ITPS will review uh, the, what was prepared and make a decision on the regional chapters. The, ultimately, the report will be launched on the War Soil Day, so the 5th of December 2025. So this was, in short, an anticipation on what will happen on the writing of this important uh, document. Um, I don't know if there is any question. So this is just an anticipation. More information will follow also based on the, on the decision, the future decision of the editorial board. As I told you, the threats will, well, the risk will likely go back to be threats. So, and we'll also go from eight to 10 <laughs> again. And then I'm sure that other changes will also be, be proposed. <coughs> If there is no question, I would like to thank you all. I'm sorry that uh, we run late, but not so late, <laughs> I hope. Um, I thank you so much for having been with us. I invite you or oh, I invite all of you that did not send uh, the presentation that you that you gave to Filippo to please do it <coughs> so that we can upload it on the Pacific Soil Partnership website. And as anticipated, we will follow up by email. We will send you all information related to what was presented during this meeting. And we will also inform you and ask for your opinion on the date of the next meeting in June. Um, I close by inviting you all to please uh, uh, attend the, the upcoming plenary assembly of the GSP. I will send you more information about it by email. You're welcome to attend and also to contribute to the discussion. So it's, a, as you know, uh, the plenary assembly is our highest decision uh, making body and also the highest uh, opportunity we have to discuss everything about the GSP. And we will also discuss the new GSP action framework as we mentioned several times. So your opinion is really valuable because it will also have a direct impact. So the, the, the decision that will be made at this meeting will have a direct impact on how uh, we move forward working with the regional soil partnership. So I will stop talk now and uh, I thank you all again. I wish you a great day and I wish you, Philippe, a good night. And thank you for having been with us. Bye bye. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to the presenters. Thanks, stay everyone. Safe. Hey, Peter, thank you. Eh? Yeah, thanks, uh, Peter. Yes, thanks, Rob. Hey, Rob, Rob, thanks.
<laughs> now we need a fun time to all get together for real. Thank you, you everyone. Guys, you guys come to Tonga because we are just recovering, so no worries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you take care of it. It's been a tough year. Because my, my, my legs are tight. I'm in charge of the recovery, so... <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, if we come to Songa, we, we will bring some wine to you are with us just to <laughs> just to recover. Okay, <laughs> Binaga, bye. Okay, bye. stay safe. Thank you very much. Bye. All right. Good to see you guys.